Welcome to um, the Joan Didion Room and, and with Joshua Cohn. It's great to see so many people pack the room in for fiction. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I think if there's, if there's a fire, we're just all dead. I just want you to realize that right now. <laughs> um, this is uh, Joshua's sixth book, sixth novel, uh, sixth book. I th think so. Yeah, yeah. roughly. Maybe, yeah. I won't tell you how many thousands of pages uh, into <laughs> your career with a couple of seven, eight hundred books along the way. Um, and he recently won the Pulitzer Prize for this, as many of you know. Thank you. Um, where, where were you when you found out about the Pulitzer? Well, first of all, hello, everyone, <laughs> and, and, and it's really nice to be here. Um, uh, I, was, uh, I was in Jerusalem, actually, oh. of all places, and if people know uh, Jerusalem, I was in um, a place called Mishkanot Shananim, and I was actually in the old windmill at Mishkanot Shananim, which has one window and one light, and then was sort of leaked to the press that that's where I was staying. And it, it's high enough that from a lot of places in Jerusalem, you could check to see if my light was on. <laughs> so I quickly left the windmill. Um, but yes, I was, I was in Jerusalem for the, um, for the Jerusalem Writers Festival. That must have been pretty cool to be at a Writers Festival and uh, get the Pulitzer, huh? You mean, you know, you talk to the other writers or? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I did, I did, I did, but I mean very quick. Hey, what's up? What's new with you? <laughs> right, right. I mean, you know, I, I, it was more like the dealing with, with the Israeli press. And so, yeah, uh, that, it, that was pretty stressful. Very, Has, very, very stressful. Um, I began to, I, you know, I see these, like, there's a picture of me before. It's just like, this is all since then. This is, that, 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 that was the stress. You're not trying to hide your identity or something, you're not. Uh, no, you know. and I wasn't trying to blend in with certain elements in Jerusalem either. I was just, you know, trying to hide from the Israeli press. Yeah. I'm just curious, how many people here have read the book? Oh, well, that's pretty solid, huh? Yeah. All right. For those who haven't. Um, they can leave. <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. so, um, you want to tell, us, tell those who haven't a little bit about the, the book, the premise? Yeah, I mean, the, the premise, I think, is very, is very, to me, it was very simple. Uh, 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 and maybe for, for the premise, I can talk about, you know, how I came to the premise, yeah. which was that uh, uh, Harold Bloom, the, the um, great literary critic and, uh, uh, and scholar, professor of romantic poetry and, and Shakespearean, um, Shakespearean in many ways. Um, he had written about a, a previous book of mine called The Book of Numbers that came out in 2015. And, um, and it, was, it was lovely. It was, you know, I, I found out that Harold Bloom had written an a, essay about uh, a book of mine. And then about five minutes after I found out that, I get a call. And it's Harold Bloom asking me for a favor, which is classic Bloom. <laughs> So, and, and, um, and he wants to sort of, he's thinking about writing a memoir. Um, he actually wrote a memoir kind of of his life in poetry called, uh, you know, the Take Up Arms book. But this was, this was going to be a gossipy kind of where the bodies are buried kind of thing. And he wanted someone from outside of Yale and sort of from outside of his academic world to kind of work with him on it. And it became fairly clear early on that, that, um, uh, uh, that he was kind of, he was too ill to, to really be able to complete it. But um, I, having sat with him for a number and number of sessions, there were just amazing stories that he would tell and, you know, about, you know, going skinny dipping with Derrida, you know, just crazy, crazy, crazy stories, you know, uh, way too many drunk driving stories. It's hard to get that image out of my mind now. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, you know, very attractive man, Harold would say. My dear, he was in wonderful shape. Um, and and uh, but one of the but while he's talking, he's telling some other story. I think a story about about maybe Dwight McDonald or something. He has he has a, a CNN is on in the background and it's on mute, and suddenly Bibi Netanyahu is on is on CNN, doing whatever Netanyahu does, and um, and Harold just looks up and he says, y you know, I met that guy. And so I'm thinking, okay, is this in the 90s when BB was UN ambassador or something? Is this some like Upper West Side party? What is this? And he said, no, I think he was like 10 years old. 
And it's when his father came and uh, and interviewed for a position as a you know historian, you know, in European history, a medievalist. And he told me this story. And the story was a very kind of basic outline of meeting a guy that he did not get along with, being asked to take around a guy, even though Harold was in the English department and Benzio Netanyahu, Bibi's father, is a historian, uh, really because Harold was the only uh, J other Jew at Yale at that time. And, um, and so feeling put upon for this. And so I expanded this story um, because I found in it something, you know, that just I couldn't, you know, drop it. Harold would say, "Why are you interested in the story?" I was like, "Tell it again, tell it again." And he was, I, I said, "Don't you understand?" And you know, and he he said something like, "You know, it's it's very hard to know that you've lived a metaphor." <laughs> so, so this story is set kind of when that actually happened, which is in the late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, the story said yeah. in, in 1959, 1960. I should say, you know, Harold told me a version of the story. Yeah. And then Jean Bloom, who's still with us, you know, she comes into the room and she's like, that's not how it happened, Harold. And then they start arguing and, you know, I mean, this is, this is at a 50 some year, 60 some year remove, right? So, um, uh, uh, but, but yeah, the, the, the basic outline of the story of, the, of hosting, well, we, hosting Benzio Netanyahu, who then shows up with his wife Tzila and his three children, um, Yoni, Bibi, and Ido, uh, in tow. And in my book, uh, uh, you know, hilarity ensues. Yeah, uh, very much so. And um, the narrator, it's told in the first person. Mm -hmm. Um, from somebody who doesn't sound like Harold Bloom, but is named Reuben Bloom. Yeah, yeah. Uh. And, 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 uh, and is not an eminent, you know, uh, critic no. of romantic poetry, but is a professor of taxation studies, which I think I made up, I don't know. Why taxation? But why taxation? Yeah, why taxation? Okay. You know, Harold, um, I, it's difficult you know, being, um, I want to say friendly, but I mean, he was just, you know, Harold was this unbelievable force and, it, and, and, and certainly, you know, we were generationally very separated, but it was difficult being close to a critic, right? Um, as a writer, I, I don't really want to no. know what a critic thinks. <laughs> and, um, and Harold's, you know, probably most famous contribution, certainly most famous contribution to, to, to literary theory or size, is, uh, is his kind of idea of, of influence, his influence theory, which comes from an idea of, uh, he building on other people's ideas of belatedness, which with the idea that, you know, every generation feels like it's born too late for quote unquote authentic experience. And, um, and w every writer then has to labor under the influence of their predecessors. And how does one deal with that influence? Do they feel that the past is, is crushing? And do they in some way become crushed by the past and become its servant? Or, um, or do they believe the past is incorrect and that their work can offer a corrective to what had come before? And this entire idea of debt and obligation, I wanted to satirize through uh, taxation studies. The past is like a tax on, on you know, on the writer, right? Yeah. And, and the, also the idea of, you know, who do you pay taxes to? You pay taxes to your city, to your county, to your state, to the federal government, you know, to, to whom you pay your taxes, it defines, you know, who you are, right? It's, it's, this is the block that you are a part of, whether you like it or not. And, yeah. and I, I felt that, especially writing a book that was set in, in 59, 60, which is, you know, really the emergence of Jewish American writing, right, with Goodbye Columbus, Roth was 59. Um, and I knew that as long as I lived, I would have to hear this Philip Roth bullshit forever. So I decided, like, let's look at this influence idea and let's look at debt and obligation and influence and heredity and let's, let's look it straight in the eye. And there's a, um, a central conflict or two different ways of, um, of being Jewish in this book, in these it, two characters, Reuben Bloom, Mm -hmm. And Benzion Netanyahu. Yeah, very much so. I mean, there is, you know, a, a, there's two different kind of approaches to what neither of those people would call their identity, right? They're just who they are. Right. Um, uh, there are also two different approaches to history, right? And yeah. the idea of, um, you know, 
Bloom comes from a uh, an American meliorist history standpoint, which is the idea that you know the world might not be great now, but it's always progressively getting better. Each generation tries to reform the sins of the previous generations, and you know the the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice. Right. Whereas Benzio Netanyahu comes from a, a, a circular idea of recurring traumas that history is just the history of of, of oppression, exile, expulsion. Strife, and that the only way cyclical, like, cyclical like history, a Nietzsche kind of, yeah, like the, right, absolutely, or yeah. Spenglerian idea yeah. of, of of these historical patterns recurring, and um, and and both of those ideas of of history and also of um, of religiosity and, sp and spirituality inform their 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 politics, and um, and so their their conflict really comes you know down to I think. Um, you know, do you think the world is um, getting better, or do you think it's as bad as it's always been? And but Rubin doesn't just have that worldview. But he also kind of lives a life that seems, you know, to to my reading, who I'm not Jewish, um, not even like George Santos. I'm not Jewish. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. Maybe maybe I'm a little bit Jewish. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, you know, he seems like he is very much not Jewish. You know, he. Right. I mean, yeah, his. Yeah. Uh, he, and you say he describes himself as when I'm growing up. I, I turn the other cheek like Jesus Christ, and and I, uh, and he loves his shaker chairs and his faux Persian rugs. It's like all these other religions that he right. surrounds himself with in his home. Yeah. And yeah. and it's really the the arrival of Benzio Netanyahu that that kind of calls him. Yeah. Calls him on the carpet. Calls him on his Persian rug. You know, yeah. no, and and and, and right. sort of, you know, and and and, and, and on his Persian rug. Yeah, too. absolutely, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and 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 one of the one of the ideas that that I was trying to really, you know, deal with was, uh, you know, that generation, um, you know, Bloom's generation, which is a little bit, you know, older than the the the, the Roth generation, right? Uh, 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 even though they were they were friendly, they would consider themselves somewhat, you know, contemporaries. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 they were people who have a far more optimistic view of America and American possibility than, than people in my generation. You know, one of the things that I thought about while kind of doing this character, especially because so much of it kind of deals with and subverts a lot of Jewish American writing, right? Because it's about a period of Jewish American writing, but dealing with a political, a body of politics that none of those writers really touched in the 50s and 60s, right? And so um, one thing that I thought about kind of throughout uh, uh, writing it was, you know, after after 9/11, um, was in New York, and uh, uh, Philip Roth puts up uh, an American flag in in the window of his apartment, and you know the word went around. That's how you know that that's where Roth lives, right? And and this sort of um, this truly felt patriotism and a truly and a truly held belief in America, um, I I was fascinated by because it was certainly something that didn't exist and doesn't exist, I think, among m many of my peers. I would say most of them. And, and so I was interested in this idea of people who, because of their positive or optimistic view of democratic plurality, could convince themselves that, in fact, they were as American or more American than they were Jewish. But you deny him that throughout in the book. He's really subjected to these tremendous humiliations by his colleagues throughout he has to play right. Santa and, he's, and he's told that that's the price of doing business and and, and, and even at the end where he real, literally does not have a place at the table mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I mean I wanted yeah. to write a lot of this book through the eyes of um, through through I would say Israeli eyes or at least Netanyahu esque eyes do, do you ever consider having Reuben Bloom marry a non Jewish person when you were writing his character uh no, I, I probably too extreme. No, well, for that generation, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that that why um why Edith, who's the yeah. mother, is 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 sort of Edith, and and Celia and Tanya has a little bit of the same role, but Judy certainly does. The women in this book, I think, though they each have their very separate characters and very and come into conflict, yeah. I and mean, they're the people who get into a physical fight at the end of the book, yeah, right. toward the end of the book. Um, they, they're also kind of watching this man fight, right? You know, they're watching these two men scream at each other about history, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and in a way, I wanted to, I, I think what was most interesting about Edith's character was, to me, was to actually 
you know, tell him, you know, we don't need to argue about history. I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. Right. No one cares. It's, Look, no yeah. one's killing us outside. The weather's fine. It's, you know? It's, uh, it's an important moment. It, yeah. Um, talking about history, tell, tell us about Benzion and, you know, how he comes in with his view of, he's a, a scholar and an expert in a very particular period of history. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I, I think it became, you know, I, I grew up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and, um, and so the Netanyahu's were always in the air. Like, he came to visit my school when I was in school right? growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, um, the father. No, no, Bibi. Oh. Bibi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, Atlantic City is like the summer home for Philly. He was uh, with the Boston Consulting Group for a couple of years, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, 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 you know, but he was kind of so in the, in the air and in the local Jewish community that I never really asked why were these people in America. You know, I just, yeah. it's not something just if someone is there, they're there, right? You're not like, how did this happen? And, um, and really how it happens is, 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 is the story of, of, of early Zionism, or Zionism's plural, let's say, where um, essentially Benzio Netanyahu chose the side of revisionists, or one of the revisionists, um, Jabotinsky, um, who in, in a very kind of Wikipedia and, and you know, short summary version of things, you know, wasn't content to wait around for the great powers of the world, for the British, for the Americans, to give them a state. It thought the purpose was to take it, yeah. and um, and because of agitation um, that led to a number of you know terrorist acts and and also incitements of, of rioting, um, he became persona non grata in um, in Palestine, and uh, and couldn't get a job there, and so that kind of put him on the path of being a itinerant adjunct. So right? he was at Hebrew University and trying to get a. He was Second, at Hebrew. Yeah. He was at Hebrew University, and um, and every year that he was studying, more and more um, refugees were coming from European universities. Experts. Experts, and it says, yeah. you know, why are we going to hire like a local boy when we can basically get the entire faculty of Friedrich Wilhelm University, right? And um, and so he was forced to sort of take his act on the road. He also he became a, um, a representative of Jeb one of the Jabotinsky movements in the United States. Mm -hmm. And he um, ends up becoming, he finishes his doctorate in Philadelphia, and he ends up becoming a, um, a, a scholar of the Inquisition, and specifically of the Iberian Inquisitions, which were regnal inquisitions, not papal inquisitions, and, um, and uses his interpretation of the Inquisition to, um, to sort of justify, um, um, you know, the existence of, 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 of the Jewish state. And, um, and in a way, he's a deeply, to me, sympathetic and tragic figure. And it's just interesting how people who I might not politically agree with, you know, become sympathetic figures. And the moment when he has a son who has the exact same beliefs that he does, it becomes odious because the difference is power. And Benzio Netanyahu spends the most consequential decades of, of Jew, I would say, of all of Jewish history, you know, with the exception since, uh, you know, 70 C, since the Roman destruction of the Second Temple, right? He spends the most consequential decades of Jewish history not being murdered in Europe and not founding his country um, in, 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 in Palestine, in Israel. He's in suburban Long Island and suburban Philadelphia, He's boiling with resentment. Sidelined. Sidelined, wanting to be useful and raising his children in a hothouse of his own resentments. And, and his thesis about the Inquisition, the other thing that happened in 1492, right, um, is, is what? Is, is that Jews, for the first time, are, are really considered in a different light. There was this movement to convert mm -hmm. Jews to Yeah, I mean, it, it was yeah. really about the racialization of, 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 of Judaism. Um, uh, it was, you know... All of these, uh, uh, many Jews in the Iberian Peninsula converted to Catholicism. Right. And, um, and even after the, they converted to Catholicism, that didn't provide the, um, uh, uh, the monarchy with the, let's say, enough of a political bulwark against a papacy and, 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 and also a way to control nobles and stuff. And this players. is like a couple generations later. Just a couple generations later. later. So they so, convert it. Right, so they essentially, they essentially yeah. invalidate conversions. Say it doesn't matter what you say you believe. It doesn't matter if you go to church. It doesn't matter if you're baptized. It doesn't matter if you're the child of someone who converted or baptized. It's about blood. And that was, in, in Benzio Netanyahu's mind, that was the racialization of, of Judaism that creates the 
pattern that then, of course, recurs with, with, with the Holocaust. So it's a critical shift from being a religion to becoming a, ra a race or a... a yeah, I mean, way. he considers it yeah. a, you know, a, 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 you know, that that was the major European shift in the understanding of it, yes. Yeah. And is that, is that something that's widely accepted uh, amongst uh, medieval scholars, that this was the motivation for the... Because, you know, the story, the story that you also hear the other explanation that, that although they converted, it was just uh, yeah. on the surface and that they still have menorahs. The Muranos, they, yeah, right, the Muranos yeah. being different from the conversos. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, 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 can, yeah. you can get into a lot of pettifoggery uh -huh. and details with this. None of us were around in the 15th century. I think a lot of, I, I will say that, that as someone, as an outsider, as a fiction writer, poking around in this world and speaking to a lot of people who knew Ben Zion Netanyahu, I think a lot of the reaction to his scholarship is really, was really a reaction to him personally. Yeah. Kind of was an asshole, you know? <laughs> and, and he tended, he tended not shows to... Shows a little bit. He shows a little book. bit, right. And, it tended, he, and he, didn't, he didn't really work to, let's say, convert people to his point of view. He tended to yell them down, you know, and shout them down. So, um, you know, I think that, that one of the primary uh, questions was, you know, and, and this is my favorite thing, he, he gets into a... a, a uh, there's a, another scholar of the Inquisition named Amerigo Castro, and these were kind of two... So it's a great name, first of all. And these two are these, these two antagonists in this fight about you know, what happened in the 15th century. And at um, and it, it one conference that they're at, um, this is not a thing in the book, so if people have read the book, this is like the, the DVD extra, right? <laughs> is um, they, they get into this argument because Amerigo Castro says, okay, I'm maybe going to agree with you that this represents the racialization. And that was a big thing yeah. that, you know, I'm maybe going to agree with you. But the racialization at that point, right, was, um, was uh, uh, through the father, right? And, uh, and Benzio Netanyahu is through the mother. That's the traditional Jewish yeah, way. Right. But the way that is represented in Jewish texts is the, the distinction between zera and dam, or between sperm and blood. So in the middle of this conference, you have these two old guys. One guy is screaming sperm, and the other guy is screaming blood. And they're just going, zera, dam, zera, dam, zera, until they have to pull these guys apart. So, you know, that's the flavor of medieval studies, at least in the <laughs> 60s and 70s. Men yelling sperm and blood. Sounds like a day at my emergency room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> so, you've got this, um, so this racially, it's so interesting to me because, you know, I never would think, uh, you know, that because my grandfather was Buddhist that I'm one quarter Buddhist, you know? <laughs> you're We're laughing. all one like, quarter Buddhist. We, we, <laughs> right. <laughs> The world would be really nice, yeah, but yeah. but this whole thing, like you could be a quarter Jewish, you know, that 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 is a blood thing, and and so this is 1490, and then in 1940, obviously the mm -hmm. same argument comes, and it's used in a very ugly way. Sure, I right? mean one of that the things the, that it's blood, so it doesn't matter what you believe, what you call yourself, you've got this yeah blood thing, and it's 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 like in America with the with the blacks or the natives. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're like one drop black blood, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book about caste is about, sure. yeah, the similarities. I mean, I, I, I tend to think of it as, you know, it was one of these ideas about, um, about democracy or, you know, pluralistic democracy and about um, tribalism and, and, yeah. and the idea that, that once you are not sort of licensed or your identity isn't honored as an equal partner in egalitarian you know, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy, you begin backsliding into tribalism. And that's certainly something that we've seen in the United States. And, you know, I found it, you know, in my other role in life of, of being a political reporter, which I've done a decent amount. I mean, I, I remember being, uh, uh, you know, on the campaign trail, you know, too many times and, you know, talking to uh, a lot of people and you sort of, you know, you, you ask these Americans, you know, where are you? you know, where are you from? You, you know, I was asking people because they drove out to a, a private airport for a rally, you know? And so instead of saying, I live 10 miles down the road, they say, you know, I'm 30% Irish, 40% yeah. you know, uh, French, you know? And it's like nothing adds up to 100 too. No, they're, it's they're, like, you know, they, they end up there like 109% something, but it's like, you know, and, and that, that is, you know, so, so without a doubt, there is the, you know, for, uh, for communities of color, there is that, you know, um, idea of one drop stigma, but then there's also the total identity psychosis of white America of not really being able to just say, I am American. Yeah. Uh, right. That's, 
I was also thinking that, you know, I was wondering in the book, does Benzion decry that uh, racialization, or does he say this is actually what being Jewish is, is that it is a heritable um, blood thing? Uh, I think, you know, politically, um, I, I, you know, I don't know that I want to speak for him totally, but I would guess that, uh, um, that it, it's not a question of what he thinks is right. Um, in, in, in the sense of, in the sense of, you know, the, the, the Jabotinskyites, right, and, and the people who really come out of the revisionist yeah. movement, you know, for them, it's not about what they think is is a model for uh, a successful society or functional society. He, the, he, what, what he's essentially saying is is that history has taught us that an ethno nation state is the only way to survive. Because it ties into Zionism, I think, because just becoming part of a religion in the modern world does not give you claims to land, hmm. right? But right. if you're um, of a descendant of an ethnic people, you hmm. can claim an ancestral homeland. So, hmm. it, it, so I think it is, uh, you know, you can say, well, it's used negatively in 1490 and mm -hmm. terribly in 1940, but mm -hmm. now it's actually part of the Zionist claim. Sure, sure. Though you know, I the, everyone always likes talking about the the right of return to Israel. But anyone who's ever had to deal with the Israeli Minister of Interior to get documents <laughs> approved knows that it you have to really want to go. Yeah, like really want, like mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, and 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 especially if you're not if you're a secular, if you're Chiloni, if you're not religious, you have to really, really, really <laughs> want to go. Um, I, I think that the uh, uh, you know one of the one of the interesting things when we talk about you know the nexus of, of religiosity, let's say, and 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 politics is essentially the um, the idea that you, for many the, the, the defining trait of Judaism for for I would say to my mind the defining trait of Judaism beyond monotheism, right, which is an important one, is the idea that that the Messiah has not yet come. And it's the, um, it's the transmutation of messianic longing to a political realization that marks the existence of the state of Israel. So these were people who, uh, Ben Zion Netanyahu, I mean, and the revisionists in general, these were people who are, you know, they, they are not praying. They are not waiting for Messiah to come. Their, their post-Holocaust response is that um, the Messiah didn't come, God was absent, the um, the messianic redemption of the Jewish people is a political is implicitly a political redemption, and um, uh, so so in a way their spirituality has been transmuted into politics, and we've all agreed to call it politics. But what it essentially is, it's a, it's a, it's a theological belief, and um, so so I, I would also caution at the idea of kind of saying that 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 these things are separate categories. You, and, and so you set up this. This great conflict. There's two different ideas of of how to be Jewish marriage. You have Reuben Bloom, mm -hmm. and then you have Ben Zion, who is a Zionist and revisionist Zionist. Mm -hmm. And then you ha their wives are almost like an extension of mm -hmm. their worldview. And I, I guess I would call Zila a, a revisionist house guest. Uh, she's a revisionist because, house guest. Yeah. Because she's like, I'm going to take that. I'll take yeah. your dress. I'll take your jewelry. I'll, your daughter's going to be the babysitter. Uh, yeah, my son yeah. can sleep with your daughter, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, and it's the test of liberalism, right? Liberalism says, sure. On the other eat, hand, sure, Yeah, sure. Eat my food. Sure. You know, you want to borrow my dress? Borrow my dress. You want my daughter to be your babysitter to be your kids? Sure, we'll do that, you know? And, and liberalism yeah. gives and gives and gives. But it's, the, but, but it's always the paradox of liberalism that liberalism is always forced to become illiberal in order to defend itself, right? The, you know, the, the point at which liberalism says no, it ceases to be liberal by a certain definition. And that really is the test between the Netanyahu's and, and the Bloms. Yeah. And, and you, you set these very serious ideas mm -hmm. in uh, almost like a sitcom staging <laughs> farce in a way. You know, so it's not just a Philip Roth thing, but there's also an influence of of a different kind of Jewish writing of, of these uh, humor writers. Yeah, you know, or, or, conscious, uh, or of, you know, you know mm -hmm. or of early television of, that, of, yeah, that, of right. that era. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, I knew an, you know, an old, old time writer of television who, you know, among the many kind of wonderful things he told me was is just, you know, 
you have a bunch of different people, right, from different backgrounds packed into one house where no one knocks, all the doors are unlocked, you open the door, you burst in, you know, no one has any privacy. And he says, you know, sitcoms were basically tenements. And, um, and so I, I had that in my mind, you know, an enormous amount, you know, of that sort of um, enforced intimacy. Loud enforced intimacy. Yeah. Loud enforced intimacy and, and, and also this idea of, you know, you can cause great pain to someone, but between episodes, no one remembers the pain that you caused like last week, right? Like the memory is, is wiped clean and everyone is forgiven until the damage starts again in the next installment. And it seems like your book rewards close reading. And so I think about uh, Benzion leaving his boys there in front of the television and, and they're debating whether to watch Gunsmoke or Bonanza or, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and this Western and you, and you plant the seed. Mm -hmm. uh, why, you know, tell us why you chose for them to be watching Westerns instead of game shows or something. Yeah, uh, I just, you know, the, I mean, the, 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 it's insane to me that Westerns existed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was, I was born, I'm not that young, I was born September 1980, right? But it's crazy to me that Westerns existed. That, and I don't mean, I, and I don't mean the, the countercultural Westerns that came along, I don't mean the, you know, the, the disgruntled revisionist Westerns, but the Westerns where you shot a bunch of Indians, you know? Like I just, that to me is, is like, and people watched this, right? And, and they watched it and then they were like, you knew the names of the cowboys, whatever they were, there were no cows, the guy with the hat, you knew their names, but you didn't know the names of the other guys they shot. And, um, and this to me was, the you know, It's part of the American myth, right? It's this, part of the American the, myth. The manifest destiny of right. moving Western and... And, you know, we have, and, and I, have, I have family on my, on my mother's side that, you know, uh, uh, that when they came to the States, you know, educated me about, you know, the Soviet Westerns, where it's, you know, the Indians were killing the cowboys, you know, and, and the Reds were good, you know? And... Um, <laughs> those and, Reds. Those Reds, right. I got it. Right. <laughs> And yeah. so, you know, I, I, but, but I, th I think something about that, yeah, about the conquest narrative, the conquest narrative, the manifest destiny narrative, the unquestionable kind of appetite for, for land, for space, the libertarianism of it, I guess we'd call it libertarianism, which is a very long word for just doing whatever the fuck you want, right? It's, it's you know, this to me is, is um, you know, th this to me is something that is um, quintessentially American, right? And, um, and, and, and yet is also something that, that, that relates very much to Netanyahu's experience. Yeah. Did you, uh, of the two experiences, do you find one voice that, you, that resonates more with you than the other? Which one? Between, the, the, between Bloom and, and, between Ruben and Benzion. Ah, uh, no, I kind of, I, you know, you always want to go with one and then leave them and go with the other. And, you know, the ping pong is fun, just sending them back and forth against each other. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that the, the, um, there's a, a, a naivete and a, uh, uh, that, uh, in Blum that I would never want to be accused of. And there's mm -hmm. a, a callous cynicism in Netanyahu that I would never want to be accused of. And, uh, but, but that said, you know, um, there, are, there are parts of each of their, um, uh, um, I don't want to say ideologies, but of their fears that I can relate to. It's an interesting way of, of looking at history for me because I, you know, I kind of, you grow up and you study history and, and you just accept that this is history. This is like incontrovertible. And, and, you know, this is what happened and you learn it and you know it's important to learn it because then it helps you to make decisions about the future. And, and in your book, you suggest that history is actually there for you to cull for something to justify an action that you want to take. Not so much to inform the action, but actually to sure. use it to support the sure. action you've already decided to take. Absolutely, it's it's the yeah. great it's the great grab bag of justifications, excuses, yeah. you know, rationalizations. If you want to you don't want to do Shakespeare or the Bible, you can right. also just look to history. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I think, but I think that, you know, one of the things that 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 is, um, for example, you know, the the Jabotinskyites, right, or the revisionists, yeah. this is something that people don't really. 
think about, and, and, and it's not comfortable to think about, which is you know, th their great alienation from the early labor Zionist Mapai and you know, the Ben-Gurions of this world, the Weizmanns of this world, the, the people who are the founders of the state and the early rulers of the state. Um, the Jabotinskites regarded all of those, all of that block, right, as traitors, collaborationists with the British, and uh, because they did not, because they failed to save uh, over six million of their co-religionists from the Nazis. And with the Jabotinskyites who were running around the world trying to raise an army to fight the Nazis, save the Jews of Europe, and bring them to Palestine. And they were the people who were then saying, okay, these guys who ran the state made a decision that they can get a state if they just don't push that issue. And so did, what you have to understand about Benzir Netanyahu is he, he arrives in the United States with feeling as if the blood of six million people are on his hands. And, and that was crushing. So when you talk about selective histories and how we you know, can pick different things out of it, yeah. there's, you know, there, there's, you know, there's the, the narrative that you know, Israel blooms out of the Holocaust, but then there's also the narrative that no, you know, there, there are many people who had that feeling that there were absolute sacrifices made that were um, immoral and, um, and, and in some way almost invalidating. And, and that's really was Benzio Netanyahu's point of view. Could you, along those lines, could, can you um, explain the, the epigraph for us? Can you d discuss that? Oh, eliminate the diaspora. Eliminate the diaspora. The diaspora will eliminate you. Will surely eliminate well, surely, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that was a, a great Jabotinsky, you know, curtain line. You know. He, what do you mean by that. eliminate the diaspora? Uh, I stop trying to be like others. I think. I think it was. You know, that was really uh, that was a, a Tishbab. That was a ninth of Av um, address that he gave in Warsaw in the late '30s. He used that line in a few other articles too. But he was saying. You know, stop trying to tell everyone you're Polish, you're dead. Stop trying to tell everyone you're German, they're going to kill you. Stop trying to, you know, be more German than the Germans. Stop trying to, you know, convince yourself that because you have this sort of protection, that, you know, this was the idea that you have to purge from yourself, right, a diasporism. It's not about, he wasn't trying to tell the Jews to conquer Germany. <laughs> yeah. He was trying to tell them to purge their inner German because, um, because the outer Germans had decided that they want nothing to do with you, and in fact, they would want you dead. And so that, the idea that there is a diaspora, an inner diasporic person, that is a, a, a deeply, I think, um, Jabotinsky ideal. Even for people who've come to Israel already to purge some old world, some yeah. things that they brought with them from their other cultures. You're really bringing people from all over the, all kinds of different languages and cultures to Israel, right? It's not right. a monolithic no, group of not, people. No, not, not at no. all. No, not at all. And, so, and, so, and, and no. in many ways, though, the, the idea of um, you know, elim eliminating the diaspora is, is eliminating it. Um, I mean, the, 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 the joke of it is like, you know, it, it should be flipped around in a way. It's just like the diaspora will eliminate you, you, so you should probably get around to eliminating it sometime down the road, you know. And um, so, so, but, but, but I think that the 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 um, the sense of um, of being of a culture that wants to murder you is at the core of um, of, of let's say a revisionist theology. And it seems the way you set up the uh, events in the book that. That Rubin kind of runs into a lot of of that, uh, you know. And um, I, I just want to pivot for a little bit for the time we have left, and maybe have you. You had this really interesting writing project where you help someone ghost, or you. I don't say ghostwrite, but you help someone with their memoirs. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe tell us a yeah. little bit about that. I've ghostwritten a lot of books. Well, but yeah, yeah. Are you talking yeah. about the with with Edward Snowden? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's a nice guy. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone should read the book. So how did, how did that happen? How did he reach, did he reach out to you? Was, uh, how did, did you go to Russia? What, what uh, happened? How um, we have uh, uh, 
his one of his lawyers in common. Uh, uh, is this something you're allowed to talk and, about? Or? I don't know. We'll find out. Because <laughs> um, um, he knows this has taken place. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, ben Weisner at the ACLU um, was, a, was a great First Amendment lawyer, and um, and uh, he introduced us. And um, and yeah, I really just um, you know uh, helped. Uh, uh, Ed had everything. I mean, this was Ed's story. This was Ed's life. This were, you know, Ed's words. And um, I just, you know, helped it lo look like a book. Oh, all right. Well. <laughs> and and next project. The next project that I'm doing. I mean, I I've been I've been I've been doing a, a, a fair amount. I'm writing a novel. I'm almost finished with the novel. But I've been doing recently a lot of. Um, Introductions, translations, and edited versions of things that have sort of disappeared. I did a, a version of um, Leon Fuschwanger's uh, *The Oppermanns*, which uh, which came out a, a little bit ago, and I'm doing uh, another Fuschwanger book. Um, and I translated and edited a, um, a selection of Elias Kennedy's work, um, and I'm going to continue to do some more volumes of of Kennedy. Um, and uh, and and I think my next. Project is a, a I've, I've wanted to do this for a long time, which is these are translations from Hebrew and Arabic into um, into English, and um, we we don't. My idea is you're not telling the reader um, what language it came from before they've read it, and the idea of you know that these poetics are actually very um, um, they reflect one another and they're very similar, and it's only when you sort of know the identity of the source that suddenly it becomes charged with a certain valence. So it's sort of a, a an anonymous uh, uh, poetry translation project. So it's almost, you know, your book, A Heaven of Others. Mm -hmm. is that, just, can you just tell us a few minutes about that? Because I thought that was so interesting, the premise. That was a, yeah, that's a book where a 10-year-old uh, Israeli boy um, you know, dies in a in a suicide bombing and uh, during the second intifada in two thousand and one, and ends up in the Muslim heaven. And but the, <laughs> but the suicide bomber was also is also a young boy. Is yeah. a ten, a ten year old Palestinian. Ten, ten, Palestinian boy. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's it it it, it happens on uh, on Rakhov Chernikovsky on Chernikovsky Street and a lot of the 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 um, the language of the book comes from the the poetry of Shaul Chernikovsky who will. Um, um, is sort of the, I don't want to call him the, he's the, the other face of early Hebrew poetry. He's the anti-Bialik. So because they die in this embrace, they go to... Yeah, yeah, he kind of holds on to the boy very tight. So the, this is very scientific, you can yeah. tell, right, right. Yeah. And he holds on to the boy very tight, and that's how he gets to the Muslim heaven. Yeah, and then he kind of searches for what he calls the heaven of his own belief. Um, yeah. Um. And then the Book of Numbers. Uh, I just want to get you an idea of the scope of Joshua's mind. <laughs> it's tiny. It's tiny. Book of Numbers was that. That was a, that's a book from 2015 about about. It's a sort of historical novel about the birth of the internet and 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 um, and really about um, its corruption by um, government and business, and um, and and it's, it follows a, a, a ghostwriter. Right, named, named uh, Joshua Cohen, uh, <laughs> who's ghostwriting the memoir of a tech CEO whose name is Joshua Cohen. <laughs> so you know they're they're Google gongers, right? They, they 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 their search results, you know, interpenetrate, and um and and so it's a it but but it's really you know a person who comes from the world of books who is the ghostwriter, and a person who comes from a world that the ghostwriter perceives has conquered books or taken books over. And so it's called, um, I mean, the book is Book of Numbers, and it's based on um, the Book of Numbers from the Bible, which is the, the, it's the fourth, it, the Book of Numbers is a very weird book because um, it's where story breaks down. You know, people know the five books of Moses, right? You, you have all these really, you know, good, I don't know, famous stories, right? Uh, I don't know, the creation of the world, for example, you know, Tower of Babel, you know, expulsion from Eden, then you have the Exodus, you go in, you know, and, you've, and, and, you know, and everyone knows that story up until, you know, Moses and parting the Red Sea and cool, and then it's like, well, then what happens? And the answer is, you know, what happens is the, the, the book, you know, of Numbers, 
which is you know wandering through the desert for 40 years until the slave generation from Egypt dies out because slaves cannot inherit the new land. And, and so it's a, book of, it's a book where narrative breaks down and becomes about census. It becomes about taxes, right? I mean, the book of Numbers is called Numbers because it begins with a census. And, and a census for the purpose of, of like raising an army. And, uh, and then, so, so I, it's sort of a book about the breakdown of narrative and wandering in a conceptual desert before you're being remade into the new people. Except in the book, the promised land is the internet, unfortunately. It's the book, it's the book that Harold Bloom really loved. From Harold the, liked it, yeah, and he didn't know anything about the internet. Well, he, yeah. more than likely he listed it as like this list of like the t best books by a Jewish American writer. And, I have to say, yeah. one of the first times I, I, the first time I met Harold personally, he you know, comes to the door and he has his, his you know, quad cane and he comes to the door and he, um, he just looks me in the eye and he just recites from memory two pages of my book and he would have gone on more, but I just had to, inter I just, I couldn't do it. And you know, he had this, this eidetic photographic memory. It was amazing. Oh, super. Yeah. Well, we were looking forward to your to see what comes next oh. from you, and, and thank you very much for, for sharing your thank time you. with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.